Hello, I'm Matthew King and today I'm going to talk to you about Revolver. Revolver is the seventh studio album by The Beatles and it was recorded in April 1966. It comes in a very interesting position in the Beatles' output where they've been building successively in a series of extraordinary albums, every one of them in a way a masterpiece, but with a significant change of focus with Rubber Soul, what we call the middle period. And then we get Revolver, and then after it comes Sgt. Pepper, and the sequence of extraordinary late albums going through the White Album, and then the final albums, Let It Be and, and Abbey Road. So there it is, pretty much at the centre of the album. And I suppose you might say that it has a kind of centrality in every sense. Nowadays, it's considered one of the Beatles' very best albums. Uh, it used to be considered junior, a junior partner to Sgt. Pepper. The, the consensus at the time, anyway, was that Sgt. Pepper was really the masterwork of the output. Uh, nowadays, I think the critical shift has moved slightly away from that. Revolver tends to be put at the top of lists of, of the best Beatles albums. Really great, sincerely. Really great. As usual with the Beatles, Revolver is this marvellous melting pot of cultural influences. Here we are in 1966, the, the band has decided to uh, have a break from touring, so not much was happening in the early months of 1966. Paul McCartney was listening to lots of classical music, and quite a lot of it by contemporary composers. He was a big fan of Luciano Berrio. <laughs> and also checking out the latest pieces by Stockhausen. <laughs> John Lennon was experimenting with LSD and reading Timothy Leary's uh, manual about psychedelia. Really great, sincerely. Really great. And uh, George Harrison was having sitar lessons with Ravi Shankar and studying North, North Indian classical music. So <laughs> there they all were doing their different things. And it was right in the middle of 1966 that Time magazine decided rather belatedly that, that London was the swinging centre of the world. And the Beatles themselves were, were hanging out with Bob Dylan. McCartney had dinner with Michelangelo Antonioni, the Italian film director. They were hearing all kinds of people, Stevie Wonder, uh, Roy Orbison. They were right in the middle of the party scene. Uh, London was, was an extraordinary place. You only have to look at the front cover, Klaus Forman's famous design for the front cover with its Aubrey Beardsley influenced design. Beautiful, beautiful ink drawing of the four Beatles with a sort of montage of photographs. You can see, you can see the vibrancy of the creativity. And then you've got this marvellous and in a way, unique, collaborative element. You've got the, the yin and yang of Lennon and McCartney, the, the, the absolutely unique uh, mixture of those two. You've got George Harrison as an emerging songwriter, brilliant songwriter in his own right, and of course adding to the mix his famously brilliant and concise guitar work uh, and these beautiful riffs that are so utterly memorable. And then you've got George Martin, a graduate from Guildhall School, where I teach. Uh, George Martin, a, a producer of genius and uh, a composer too, notating these, these brilliantly scored uh, passages. Eleanor Rigby, for example, with its, with its famous string octet scoring is, is George Martin's work. So you have this, this magnificent mixture. And the input that each Beatle had are contri contributions from the four of them. And so you can never entirely say this song or the success of Eleanor Rigby is because of Paul McCartney. Yes, primarily, but the other Beatles are significantly involved in, in that success. So, so it's very much a collaborative piece of work. And the essence of the Beatles is, is the collaboration. It's interesting that when the Beatles broke up and they go their separate ways, that although they're obviously talented, there's nothing like the same level of creativity coming from them as solo artists. But it's as a band that working together that the real synergy happens and the, the real genius happens. 
For the purposes of today's discussion, I'm going to focus on two songs on the album. One is Eleanor Rigby, which is primarily the work of Paul McCartney, and the other is Tomorrow Never Knows, which is primarily the work of John Lennon. And you have in these two songs, in some respects, a sort of exemplar of the creative talent behind them. In other words, they are very, very typical of the two artists. And on the one hand, you have McCartney with all his melodic fluency and a kind of um, whimsical quality. Uh, and then with Lennon, you have something really quite sort of heavy and almost dark and uh, spiritually a door opening and slightly, slightly strange, slightly mysterious. Let it A, let it B, let it C, let it D, let it S, G, H, I, K, double, wobble, wobble, you G. But having highlighted the difference between Lennon and McCartney, it's also interesting to see in these two songs, Eleanor Rigby and Tomorrow Never Knows, Certain common threads, both songs make use of very, very limited harmonic material, but do it in, in a wonderfully imaginative way. Both songs, you could say, are constructed using really just two chords. I love the fact that quite often the Beatles really do write two chord songs. There's a, a famous late example, which is the song Get Back by Paul McCartney. Uh, Get Back has just two chords. And I'm not saying that all of our songs have two chords. Many very great songs have multiple chords. Freddie Mercury, for example, has prodigious numbers of chords in his songs. George Gershwin, extraordinary number of chords. So you can write a song with many chords. But the extraordinary thing with the Beatles is that you have this imaginative handling of harmonic rhythm and uh, a certain unpredictability about the way that these things work. Let's start with Eleanor Rigby. So we have two essential harmonic regions in the song. One is C major and one is E minor. And interestingly, Beethoven in around 1806 wrote an extraordinary string quartet in E minor, which explores the same ambiguity between E minor and C major. And more recently, Igor Stravinsky was obsessed with this ambiguity in his, in his symphonies, in his symphonies of wind instruments, uh, in his symphony of psalms, in his symphony in C. And even in his Symphony in Three Movements, all four works explore this uh, tension between C major and E minor. They're very, very naive and stupid people. I'm not suggesting that Paul McCartney necessarily knew all these pieces, uh, but what I am saying is that there's a strong historical precedent for, for making use of, of this tension between C major and E minor. And the reason why it works is because both keys are white notes, and uh, they have an interesting relationship. C major is the sixth note of the scale of E minor, and so you, you have this sort of interesting pivot between something major and brighter and something minor and darker. The other thing that McCartney explores, and does it rather brilliantly, is the modality of each tonal region. The, the C major has a kind of Lydian quality, with a raised fourth, F sharp, coming back to E minor. So the Lydian mode, the scale you get, if you played from C to C and had an F sharp, that, that gives you the Lydian mode. The modality that McCartney makes use of when he uses E minor is the Dorian mode. That's the scale you get if you sharpen the sixth note, C sharp. It's a mode that's very common in medieval music and in folk music. So you have this uh, marvellous modal quality. Uh, the 
between the two chords. And the other thing that happens in the verse is the melody. There's your, there's your Dorian note, the C sharp. Imagine how much more boring it would be if he'd done a conventional thing and simply had... And it completely loses its magic. It's the, it's the raised sixth. Major, but with an A at the top, so it's C major 6, a beautiful chord. Now, as it comes back to E minor, we have the flattened 6, which gives it a mournful quality. And it's at that moment that we go into the, the chorus of the song, and McCartney gives us a chromatic element in the inner voicing. Chromatic, moving in semitones in the middle of the harmony. So underneath the... The melody with its lovely falling phrase and rising octave. Uh, underneath that, you've got the chromatic inner voice. And then a bigger leap, a, a tenth. Beautiful. And the melodic invention is so spontaneous and so richly fresh. Whenever McCartney's writing in this period, it's a marvel to behold. You know, this is a, a, a lad of, what, 25? One of the most important things about Eleanor Rigby, beyond these very important harmonic and melodic features, is the orchestration. Uh, because as far as I know, it was the first pop song that had this kind of sound, an absolutely unique sound, which was very much the result of McCartney going to George Martin and saying, I want strings like you, you gave me it yesterday, because Martin had scored this, this lovely string quartet accompaniment for yesterday. But uh, the McCartney said, but I don't want legato. I don't want smooth, syrupy strings. I want something that sounds more like the soundtrack for Psycho. Of course, Psycho is the topic of one of my other YouTube discussions. It was the sort of visceral sound of the percussive strings in Bernard Herrmann's score that made McCartney want that sort of sound. And what a brilliant thing he had in his head, because although you wouldn't necessarily think this is like Psycho, once you hear the result, you realise that there is a connection. And Martin scored it very skillfully. He had a string octet playing in this percussive way with lots of uh, dambos. Uh, and so you get this drum-like quality. There are no drums on this track. It's entirely the sound of the string quartet giving a pulse. My brother-in-law, when he first heard this uh, on a radio, he said he described drawing near some friends of his who were listening to it on the radio in 1966. And they were all amazed by the sound. They were saying, what is that sound? because they just hadn't heard the sound of a, you know, a string octet in a pop song before. Curious. Very curious. So you have this kind of march-like pulse in the strings, um, and this... It's these very characteristic components, the sort of slightly baroque writing in the in the violin sometimes and the, the C major scales in the cello. You've also got quite a lot of sustained writing. Sustained notes on the cello is a beautiful high uh, first violin in the second verse. So the writing is rather expertly handled by George Martin. It's not your average string arrangement. It's very well, it's very well done. It's also interesting that originally it didn't begin with the the, the, the sound of, of all the Beatles singing. It's such an arresting way to start with the C major, the brightness of the C major dropping into the darkness of the E minor at the beginning. Ah, look at all the lonely people. Marvellous, charismatic effect that that has. Originally, that wasn't the way it began, but they decided, probably with George Martin's uh, intervention, that that was the way to begin the song on the, on the track. I knew that that alone would sell them, 
One more thing to say about Eleanor Rigby is the quality of the lyrical writing, the, the, the text itself. When McCartney first wrote the song, he wasn't even sure what the words would be, or he certainly didn't have a fully worked up text. To some extent, I think other Beatles came in with suggestions. What's fascinating is that the finished result is so good, so poignant, so richly evocative of the reality of what it was like to live in 1960s Britain. It wasn't glamorous. It was a lonely world uh, with people struggling to survive. And the way that that's described in this, in this rather bleak way, almost reminiscent of Samuel Beckett, who's, who was still writing plays at the same time, there's something marvellously succinct and unique about, about the lyrics. You know, this is not your average songwriting. It really isn't. Really great, sincerely. Really great. We've decided to cut this video into three parts. The next video will discuss Tomorrow Never Knows. And after this, I will be analysing four more songs from Revolver. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off! Get out of my house!